yeah, don't, don't, don't panic <laughs> too much. <laughs> All right, let's pray, shall we? Thank you. Lord, we do praise you and thank you. Thank you for what we've heard, that you delight in us, that we can trust in you because of your love for us, Lord. We praise you and we ask you to give us good ears to hear now, good hearts to hear. Help me to speak. Help us all to concentrate. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I want to turn you to Romans chapter 8 and speak on verse 14. So for some days, I, I've been agitated isn't the right word, but I've just been thinking, I wonder when the next time I'm supposed to be speaking on a, a Sunday is. And I've been, I've been thinking like that for some days, and I knew it wasn't April, so I thought, don't worry, check it in May. And, uh, but I thought, well, maybe even, even if I had to speak on the first Sunday of May, I've got an idea what I could speak on. And then yesterday morning, I finally, because it was the first of May, I thought, rather than leaving it till Sunday morning and being told in the men's meeting, oh, oh, you're speaking this morning, aren't you? Or something like that. I thought I'd actually check. So I checked yesterday morning and, I, and I, it wasn't me. So I thought, that's great. Okay. And then a few hours later, Mike rang up and said, oh, will you speak tomorrow morning? So if I, the point is, if I'd been a bit more spiritual, I might have realized that it's the Lord trying to just tell me that I was actually going to be speaking <coughs> this morning. But there you go. So anyway, many apologies that it's me and not Blacious, famous Blacious, um, but there you go. Now, I did actually yesterday just make a little PowerPoint. So let me see if I can find it. There it is, you see, look at that. Romans 8, 14, about sons of God. Praise God for that. So there it is, for <clears throat> as many as are led, by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So let's read it in context a bit. So I'm going to read from verse 12 to verse 17. This is Romans chapter 8. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death, the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may also be glorified together. Amen. Wonderful words in scripture, aren't they? And in just to give a even more of an overview, in the first 11 Verses Paul has been teaching that a Christian is no longer in the flesh, but is in the spirit. A Christian is someone who's indwelt by the spirit of God, by Christ. And then in verse 12, I think Paul starts to apply some of the great truths he's been speaking in the previous 11 verses. So as we read in verse 12 and 13, he's, he's teaching about practical sanctification in other words how can we live holy lives in practice and we saw there that paul tells us to do something by the spirit he tells us to do something by the spirit the holy spirit empowers us to put to death the deeds of the the body in other words to put sin to death in us now obviously here when it's talking about the deeds of the body, it doesn't mean every deed of the body. Otherwise, I would have to stop talking now, wouldn't I? I mean, talking is a is a deed of the body, and we'd have a very quiet quiet meeting. Uh, so hopefully, there's going to be some profit in the things I say in the next few minutes. 
But if I was going to gossip or if I was going to use my tongue to backbite, then that's I, then I'd have to put to death that deed of the body. And so we can we can use that same sort of thought to consider all sorts of deeds of the body. So as you as you go down this chapter from verse 12, I, I think you see that sanctification is preparing us for glory to come. Praise God. Just read the last few uh, words in verse 30. He says, uh, these he also justified and whom he justified, these he also glorified. This is what he's aiming for. Wonderful words. And so by glorification, we, we mean that it's the state when absolutely all sin and all the effects of sin have been eradicated in us when we are in that glorious place. It's when we have a new glorified body like the Lord Jesus's glorious body. So then in verses 14 to 17, really Paul is teaching about uh, believers being sons, being, being children of God. And it, it seems to me that he's arguing something like this. He's saying if God has made us his sons, his own children, how can there be any doubt that he will see us through to the end, to glorification? And that's a tremendous thought, isn't it? So I've got four headings for this talk about being sons or children of God. The first one is only believers are sons of God. The second is what is a son of God? And we are sons by adoption. We are sons through regeneration. The third is as sons, we are specially loved by God. And the fourth is how can we know we are, we are the sons of God? So verse 14 says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons, these are sons of God. Now, Paul starts the verse as he does very often, actually. I think yesterday I counted 13 times he starts verses with this, this word for, and he also uses therefore, and he uses other words like moreover. He's always developing what he's saying from one thing to another. He starts the word that the verse 14 with for. So he is elaborating on what he's just said and in verse 12 and 13. So he's saying, if we are putting to death the deeds of the body, it is clear evidence that we are being led by the spirit of God and that therefore we are the sons of God. We don't, we're not sons of God because we're putting to death the deeds of the body, but it is evidence that we are sons of God. <clears throat> It's only sons of God who will behave in this way. And of course, it's folly to argue you're, you're a son of God if you are willfully indulging in the sins of the flesh. Now, my first point is only believers are son, sons of God. Not everyone is a son of God. This verse 14, he uses the phrase for as many as, for as many as. He's showing that being a son of God is exclusive to a, a certain group of people. Not everyone is a son of God. God is a father of some people, but not of others, except in a very general sense. The, the sense that Paul used is in Acts chapter 17. Remember, he, he, he was preaching and he said, uh, We are also his offspring, meaning that God created us all. But I believe here that Paul is talking in a very particular sense. And of course, teach, uh, scripture doesn't teach universalism. Some will be saved and some will be lost. And that's why we labor in the gospel. We're concerned about those who are lost. And we're, we're either the children of God or we are children of wrath. Look, here's a verse here. John 1, 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Not to others, to those who believe in his name who were born. Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, 
but of God. We're either children of God or children of wrath. Ephesians 2 verse 3. He says, in the past, you Ephesian believers, you were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And of course, a Christian, a real Christian, is someone who is moved from this second group, children of wrath, to the, to, to the first group, children of God. Praise God. And of course, Christians are sons of God. By Christian, I mean those who are in Christ. They are sons of God. You notice in our passage, he used the word sons once, I think, and he also used the word children. And, the, and those words are used inter, inter, uh, interchangeably. So sons are children, children are sons, and so on. There, there aren't two different groups of people. It is, it is true, of course, that different people have a different understanding and appreciation or experience of what it is to be a son of God. For example, in, you know, it talks about son in, if you read Galatians chapter four, the, the beginning there, it says, uh, I've got it written down here. The son, if the, the son, the heir is a child, and so does not differ at all from a slave, even though he is master of all. So Paul is explaining to us that this, this, this son, when he's a child, it's as if, he's a, if, as if he's a slave, even though he's actually master of all. But he's still a son. He's still an heir of his father. It's just that he hasn't yet come into all the experience of what that means. So to be a son of God is to be in a special relationship with God, not a sort of general relationship. It's to be in a special relationship with God. Because we understand that, for example, a man might forgive his slave, but his slave is not his son. He might love his slave, but his love for his son is surely greater. And for us, we're not just forgiven and redeemed and so on we are sons of god and i hope by the end you'll get that phrase into your mind sons of god and the, how astonishing it is so there are two aspects to being a son the first is adoption we are sons by adoption and the second is regeneration nobody born into this world is a son of God. We are born in Adam. We become sons of God by adoption. You know, it mentions it here, doesn't it, in verse 15. It says that Christians have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. God, eternal God, almighty God, adopts us as his sons. Now, actually, I don't want to get onto this point, but this actually distinguishes us from the Lord Jesus Christ. We are adopted as sons, but the Lord Jesus Christ, he has been the son of God from eternity. He is eternal God. He is son of God, eternal God. But I don't want to be distracted into all of that. Adoption is, is, a, is a legal matter. Adoption is bringing someone who is not a member of your family into your family legally. In adoption, the adopted person is firstly regarded as a son. That's wonderful, isn't it? That they, they are regarded as a child of the, of, of, the, of the parents. That is love. That is choice. Wonderful. Secondly, the, the, the adopted person enjoys all the privileges and rights of a, a son, and this is upheld by law. Um, and it, it said, it, of course, Paul was writing to the Romans here. He was writing in Roman times, and in in Roman law, adoption was irreversible. So that a, a man might even be able to disown his own genetic son, who'd come from his own uh, body. For example, by giving him up for adoption. But in the Roman law, he could never disown his adopted son. And that's a tremendous truth, isn't it? That God has adopted us as 
his sons. It's all amazing. I've got a verse here, I think. Yes, Ephesians 1 verse 5 it says that before the foundation of the world, God predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He purposed to do this for his people. So another verse, Galatians 4, starting at verse 4, when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. It's, a, it's amazing that God should have such love for people. He should bestow such love on people that he should regard us not just as forgiven and redeemed uh, sinners, but as his sons. It's not that he's just forgiven us. He's made us his, his, his own sons. And there's a, a verse here, if I got it, yes. Right, very famous verse, John. Sorry, it's, this is supposed to be one, John. It's, it's not, oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong verse. No, I'm not, I'm gonna go back in case you, in case you get distracted reading it. I didn't write this one down, obviously. This is one John chapter three, verse one. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. And, of course, we have incredible privileges and rights since we are the sons, not just of some great and mighty person in the world, but, but almighty God's sons. We are God's heirs. That's what it says in our passage, isn't it? Verse 17, heirs, if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and, and so on. When you, when you meditate on these things, when you think about these things, uh, it's almost too much to believe, and yet it's what the Bible teaches. In Roman adoption, the adoptee, the adopted person, <clears throat> had certain duties and responsibilities which they didn't have before they were adopted. So for example, all the property of the adoptee became the property of the uh, adopting father. He then owned nothing. Everything was his new father's. But if the, in the Roman law, if the, if the adoptee was in debt to anyone, his debts were wiped out. So in effect, he started a new life. And in, in, in adoption, the, the adoptee lost all the rights and privileges of his old family, but gained all the rights and privileges of his new family. In adoption, the adoptee was severed from his old father and gained a new father. It's a tremendous picture, isn't it, of what God has done for us. He has adopted us as sons. And you can ask the question, is this adoption an irreversible action? And Paul, Paul, is, Paul is using the analogy of Roman adoption. We know it's Roman adoption because there isn't formal legal adoption found in the Old Testament scriptures. So, and a son is always a son, isn't he? Can't stop being a son. And under this Roman law, this adopted son could not be put away. Paul is teaching something very uh, specific here about God's purpose for us. The, the, the second thing is that we are sons by regeneration. So I think this is why I put this other verse down here, John 1. This definitely is John 1, not 1 John. Uh, as many as received him, to them he gave the right. Well, we read this, read this earlier on, didn't we? But it says it's those who were, who were born of God who are his sons. And then again in, in John 3, Jesus, you know, this conversation with Nicodemus and Jesus answered Nicodemus, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again, or born from above. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. It's impossible to be in Christ unless we're born of the Spirit. Impossible to be a, a, a real Christian unless we're born from above, born of, of God. Adoption changes our status, but regeneration changes our nature. So I've now got four, four points I've written down about regeneration, which shows that regeneration brings power into our lives. So regeneration gives us a new nature. I'm going to read to you from 2 Peter. This is 2 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 2. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. And this is the point coming now that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the de corruption or the depravity that is in the world through lust. Through these, these great and, and, and precious promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature. Amen. Wonderful. Re regeneration gives us a new nature. Astonishing. Next point is that regeneration washes us. So this is, I'm going to read now from Titus. This is Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, reading from verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, praise God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. This is it, through the washing of regeneration. Regeneration washes us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our, our Savior. Regeneration gives us a new nature. Regeneration washes us. Uh, regeneration brings us into a life in which we can overcome sin. I'm going to read a verse from 1 John. This is 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And verse 9. Astonishing statement. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For his, God's, seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. It's clearly teaching. In fact, the whole of the New Testament teaches it. That regeneration brings a person into a life in which they can overcome sin. And the fourth point is that regeneration gives us a new life. And so I think it was Andy, wasn't it, being led by the Spirit of God in the meeting to read <coughs> a particular passage. He's read the verse for me, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, and so on. All old things are passed away. And I won't read it all again because we've already had it in the, in the meeting. But regeneration gives us a new life gives us a new nature, washes us, brings us into a life in which we can overcome sin. Wonderful. And of course, a son is like his, his father. You know, we, we, we understand that. We, we see it all the time. And gen genetics ensures it, doesn't it? And through new birth and, of course, through progressive sanctification, we are to be like our father. Our father has an eternal outlook. We will have an eternal outlook. Our father is one who will go the second mile and even love his enemies and, and so on. We're, we're to do, do the same. We are to be perfect, just as our father in heaven is perfect. That's what Jesus told us in Matthew 5. Our father is sinless. So, of course, it's no surprise that as his sons, we, ha we have power in our lives to overcome sins. So... 
what, what else does it mean to be a son of God? Well, we've had this in the meeting a lot, I think. We are specially loved. We are specially loved. We are sons of the living God. A son is specially loved by his father. A person, a man, might love everybody, but he has particular love for his children. God has particular special love for us as his children. So he, he plans for us. He's, he's planning out our lives. He's planning to, to bring us to glory. You know, there's that statement in Hebrews chapter 2. It's verse 10, where the apostle writing there says that he's, he's wanting to bring many sons to glory. Amen. And of course, he's, already, he's also planned good works for us uh, to walk in. I think in our men's meeting this morning, Mike Houghton was praying along these lines. Uh, in other words, the Lord has, has a purpose for our lives while we're, while we're on the earth. And Mike was saying, let's not miss the purpose today. We've got a purpose today. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. He's uh, <clears throat> God has prepared good works for every one of us. He's got he's got a, a tremendous purpose for all of our lives. And of course, because he he specially loves us, he provides for us. God provides abundantly for all people everywhere. He makes the sun to shine. He makes the rain to fall and so on. So how much more will your heavenly father provide for you? Oh, you of little faith. That's I think that's some. Jesus saying that to his disciples, isn't it? If we put him first, one way or another, he will provide everything we need in our lives. So we can concentrate on living for him and serving others instead of focusing on our own needs. Remember that in Matthew 6, there's all those wonderful verses that I, I love and have loved for so many decades where Jesus says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, and so on. And he goes after, he said in verse 32, after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And then the, 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 the tremendous promise in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. He specially, we are specially loved by God. He cares and protects us. You know, Jesus said to his disciples again in Matthew chapter 10, I don't fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He's telling them to fear God. And then you remember he said, they're not two sparrows sold for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, for you are of more value than many sparrows. What a tremendous thing that we are, we are sons of our Father. And Jesus tells us not to fear because we are precious to him. And, of course, we are specially loved. He receives us into his presence because we are his children. You know, we've often heard stories about presidents of the USA or the King of England and how everybody's in awe of them and this sort of thing. And then their own uh, son or daughter just walks into their presence and so on very easily. But almighty God, not just USA president, the most powerful person in the world, so they tell us. It's almighty God who is our father. And of course, yes, there needs to be a balance between reverence and respect and, and knowing we can approach him as our father because we are his sons. But we can approach him as our father. This is Ephesians, look, written down Ephesians 2, verse 18. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. For through him, that is through Christ, we both, that is Jews and Gentiles, we both have access by one spirit to the father. Amen. We are sons 
of our Father. And of course, in Hebrews chapter 4, it tell, tells us, says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. So, what, what assurance can we have that we are children of God? One of our daughters, I won't tell you which one, but I bet some people can guess. When she was at school and when she was at university, she, she had the ability to get very high marks. And, but she, she, she lacked assurance that she could ever pass any exams. And so she always thought she was going to fail. And actually, she, she, she was so persuasive that she pretty well persuaded us at a certain point. And she got into sixth form and so on. And we didn't mind. I mean, I didn't mind if she f failed. Uh, I always told my daughters not to work so hard. Wouldn't say that to everybody, of course, but that's what I said to my <coughs> daughters. And they didn't take any notice. But the, she, she, the, the, the fact is, in, in, to, to finish the story, she actually got, I think she got all A's for A-level and she got first for a degree and she even got some award or something. Anyway, so it was all a bit crazy, but she persuaded us that she would fail all along. She had no assurance. So the thing, the thing is this, that with, with, with regard to our personal salvation, there are two things. There's sal salvation itself, and then there's the assurance of salvation. But the former thing, salvation itself, is, is far more important than the latter. But God has taken steps to help us have the, have the latter. And I think this, this chapter, this is a major theme in this chapter. So what are, what are some of the evidences? I'm just going to go through uh, a few things that I've listed down here. I've got some ideas from some other people as well. And um, we must, find, if we are really people in Christ, we must find some of these things in our life. If you find all of them in your life, well, praise God. If you find one of them, well, that's a good start. <laughs> but I would have thought if, if we're in Christ, we must find some of these things in our life. So, for example, if, we're, if we are concerned about being right with God or concerned about our sin, that, that's surely clear evidence that the Spirit of God is at work in our lives because most people couldn't care less. Here's another one. If we, if we really enjoy feeding on the Word of God through Bible preaching, Bible study, our own reading, meditation on scriptures, and, and so on, that, that, that's that's evidence that we are children of God because the Bible says it's only babes, I, those who have been born, who desire the sincere milk of the word. In other words, if our, if our desires and our, our, our attention are taken up with God and the things of God, the word of God, he's, he's ignited something in our hearts. Okay, here's another one. It's in verse five of this chapter. If we are setting our mind on things of the spirit. Another one. We've already had it. If we're putting to death the sinful deeds of the body, that's verse 13, rather than indulging them. Another one. If we, if we love the brethren, if we enjoy the company of the people of God more than worldly people. It isn't to say we don't mix with worldly people we might want to spend a lot of time with worldly people. After all, we want to preach, preach the gospel to them. Another evidence, if we're more interested in, in eternity than in this life, so we're not afraid of dying, we believe that the promises of God in the scripture, you know, Paul says, to die is, is gain, and to depart, depart and be with Christ is far better. Pray, praise God. If we live for the glory of God, not for ourselves, if we're concerned for the lost and want to reach them for the gospel, if we exhibit something of the fruit of the spirit in our lives, I'm talking about what assurance can we have that we are the, the, the sons of God. If we want to pray, even if we find it difficult praying, but we, we stick at it, we want to pray. If we do believe, amen. We heard about it, believing, trusting today. If we do believe in Christ, in his reconciliation, in his, his uh, atonement. Of course, we're all a work in, in progress. But we've seen that, that in regeneration, 
God changes a person's life. He changes their desires. He changes their loves. He changes their di direction and so on. And we, we, we all need to go on and be sanctified. We need to be changed from glory to glory. Praise God. So <clears throat> I see this scene. I'm running out of time here. There is, of course, in this passage, but we won't talk about it. I'll just read the verse 16. There's the, the great assurance of the spirit himself witnessing with our spirit that we are that we are children of God but the, 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 the thing is that about subjective experiences is that one person might have the witness and doubt it the witness he's talking about here in verse 16 another person might claim to have the witness but in fact be deluded this is this is where we have to be a little bit careful about subjective things and, and balance it with other evidence but I hope, I hope I've said enough to, to encourage you that, 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 that there's, there's plenty of things you can, you can look at to, to, to give you assurance that you're a child of God. Because, of course, for many people, these sort of doubts come into their, their minds. We have to trust in God, though, and uh, believe, believe him, not, not trust in our experience, trust in God. In the end, you, I... We've got, we've got to believe that God loves you. He's planned <clears throat> and determined to save you, that Christ died for you, that you can be justified by his grace and his blood and through his resurrection, through faith, that you can be filled with the Spirit of God, be led by the Spirit of God. You can set your mind on the things of the Spirit and so on. You have to look away from yourself and look to Christ. You know, like the, the Israelites, Moses put a serpent on the pole and he said, look at the, 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 the bronze serpent. And because if we're, if we're waiting for a particular uh, feeling or an experience, which will always be there, which make us feel we are okay or something like that, we're, we're almost certainly be waiting till our dying day in disappointment. <laughs> but we have to get on with life. Seek him, trust him uh, to put us right if, we, if we're wrong and so on. And then let God surprise us with the glory of his presence. Amen. All right, I'm going to skip now. I haven't, I haven't finished, but I'm going to skip to the end and just put some, uh, somewhere where I've written down some things I can conclude with. Amen. So in, the, in these verses, 14 to 17, Paul is teaching uh, us that we who are in Christ are sons of God. Not everybody is a son of God. That's what we've said. Only those who are in Christ are sons of God. They are. They are those. They are saved. Um, those who are who are not sons of God are lost and need to be saved before it's too late. This is why there's an urgency about the gospel. So we said that we are, we are sons in two ways. One by adoption. Praise God. And second, by regeneration. Adoption changes our status. Regeneration changes our nature. And we said that if we're sons of our father, we will be similar to him. We will be like him. As, as children of God, we are specially loved by God. He, he plans for us. He provides for us. He cares and protects us. He receives us into his presence as his children and so on. And of course, a child, it says in our verse 14, a child of God is someone who's, who's led by the Spirit of God. And this is the principle that is, is directing a person's life. And in the context, someone who is led by the Spirit is habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body. And I, I've suggested that if we are sons of God, there'll be evidence, clear evidence in our lives. But that evidence can <clears throat> give us assurance that we are his son. So we praise God um, for his great love. Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the sons of God. It's astonishing, isn't it? Not just forgiven sinners, redeemed sinners but sons of the living God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you, worship you for your 
declarations in your word. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity of what you've had written in scripture. We do praise you for our brother Paul, who was able to articulate so many of these things so clearly to help us to understand, and so many other writers in the Bible as well. And I pray for every one of us in this meeting that we might take these words and make them our own, Lord. You've made us your sons, Lord, sons of the living God. What an astonishing thing that is. What a great privilege. Lord, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. This is all just amazing, Lord. So I pray for each one of us. Help us to, to, to lay hold of your word, to make it our own, Lord, to, to, to live according to what you've said. Thank you for the purpose that you have given us in our lives. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Um,